All right, Chakare Mot Kedeshim, which means after the death and means holy. So we're going to walk through, I don't know how far we're going to get tonight, there's so much that we can talk about, but uh, we're just going to see which way the Father goes as we work through the Torah portion. If you're not sure what the Torah portion is, the Torah portion is uh, the, the Torah, the first five books of Moses that they split up into readable sections every single week. All right, we're going to read some labels here and begin to see uh, a few interesting things. This is from Toilet Bowl Cleaner, okay? It says, safe to use around pets and children, although it is not recommended that either be permitted to drink from the toilet. (laughs) That is a warning label, my friends. Uh, Next one. This is about a particular engine. It says, warning, uh, when you're talking about the fuel, never use a lit match or open flame to check the fuel level. (laughs) I'm not sure who they make these warning labels for. But uh, it's interesting. This is a vanishing pen. This is the warning label. The vanishing fabric marker should not be used as a writing instrument for signing checks or any legal documents, (laughs) as signatures will fade or disappear completely. (laughs) This is because, listen to this, do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. (laughs) Apparently, someone actually did that and then sued the company for not telling them which side of the chainsaw to hold, okay? All right, next one. This is a great, this is an iron. Caution, this product burns eyes. Okay. (laughs) I thought it's for curling your hair, all right? It's a straight iron, curls your hair, don't use on your eyebrows or your eyelashes. Here we go here. Listen to this, this is amazing. Before using, read directions, cautions, and warnings carefully. If you do not understand or cannot read all directions, cautions, and warnings, do not use this product. If you can't read, you wouldn't know not to use the product. I love this one. Do not eat the gum from the toilet. Some kindergartner walked in there and saw, thought, wow, I get to choose my color today. And last but not least, beware. <laughs> Be careful where you drive, ladies and gentlemen. Know what the laws are because you may walk up against this. Now, this is a funny story. This is a true story. And uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but down Highway 44 on the way to Springfield, Missouri, there is an animal park on the left-hand side. It's about 30 minutes outside of Springfield. And years ago, when me and my wife were first married, uh, we decided we're going to go through this animal park. Now, it looked more like, uh, you know, uh, something out of Beverly Hillbillies, a cross with the Adams family, okay? So there's that crossbreed. It was kind of really run down, but I love animals. I'm a big hunter, and I thought, well, let's go. Well, before we went, we were trying out uh, a, a car. Uh, we actually borrowed from the dealership. We wanted to try out before we bought it. And it was a Ford Explorer. And it was, uh, it was pretty, it was brand new, brand new to us anyway. And we, they let us take it for the weekend. Big mistake on their part. Little did they know that it would have to go through a live animal park. So we went through the live animal park. And, uh, and the first thing we come to, we stop and we look over and there is a giant buffalo that is wading in the mud. It's just moving around in the mud. And we stopped, and of course, they, you buy these bags of food, okay? And, uh, and these animals know this. So when you stop and you roll down your window and you put your hand out, they know what, what, is, uh, what, what you're going to do. And so this giant bison, dumb Jim, uh, decides to feed a buffalo, okay? And so this buffalo comes up, and I'm totally like, I'm bold, and Cheryl's like, I don't think this is a really good idea to do this. I thought, it's fine, it's fine. Well, it looked a lot smaller, about 50 yards out. As it got to about 10 yards, I chickened out and rolled up the window. That was not a right thing to do because that buffalo thought, that is rude, and came up to my car, took its head and put it up against the truck and was pushing our truck back and forth, trying to get me to unlock and roll down the windows. Our car is shaking. 
he had literally rubbed the paint off the side of this truck just in a few rubs from his, from his, now it said not to feed the larger animals. I didn't do it, but I tantalized this thing. I didn't read the rules. And uh, as we continued on our journey through the the, uh, the animal park, we came to another place where there was these giant cows with long ears. And I didn't know what to think about these things. I thought they were hilarious. They had double humps. I thought, man, this is a, a cow that made it with a camel. What is this thing? And it came in, and I, I was in control of the windows. And so it came in on my wife's side. I thought it would be interesting to roll down my wife's window. I had the food. And so my wife... It, it, Jim, Jim, don't do that. As it came closer, it stuck its head inside the window. It has horns, mind you, okay? Giant horns. It has a tongue this long that comes out. It could have wiped the inside of my dash clean of all the dust. It's trying to reach for the food. Cheryl's screaming, and it, and it scares the cow and tries to take its head out, but its horns are locked into my window. So it's trying to get out. It doesn't know what to do. It's right in front of Cheryl's face. She's screaming. Its tongue is wagging all over the place. I'm laughing hysterical. And all of a sudden, this big, giant glob of slobber just comes out of its mouth right onto her leg. And it, she screamed bloody murder. And finally, it got it, its way out. And, and, and I heard about that for five years after that. Luckily, she still married me, stayed married to me after that point. But they said in the rules, don't roll down your windows and let them get in your windows because those things can, help, can happen. I didn't read the rules. Leviticus chapter 16, let's read the rule book. You'd be surprised what you can learn. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of, his, of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before Yahweh, and they died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So let's stop for just a second. First of all, I want to explain For those of you that are new, maybe you are not sure exactly what profane means. It's where we get the word profanity from, uh, but it does not mean uh, what it means today. Uh, Profane today does not mean uh, evil, okay, or or bad. Uh, Profane simply means common in Bible language, okay? So you have something that is set apart, like fine china. Uh, you You don't put dog food in a fine china bowl. Uh, you put it in a, in a dog bowl, uh, that it, profane would be something that you use common, like at our house, because we've got six kids, paper plates are pretty common for dinner time. On Shabbat, we will use our fine china sometimes, or we'll break out the really nice paper plates, okay? That's profane. Profane is common. Holy is something that's set apart. What happened was Aaron's sons, uh, Nab- uh, Nadab and Abihu, they came before the Lord with common fire, meaning that it was unauthorized sacrifice. It was an unauthor- unauthorized offering. They brought an offering before the Lord, and Yahweh did not ask them to do that. They broke the protocol, came, they wanted to come near before the Lord, and the Lord rejected their offering. Now, see, that doesn't play in most of our theologies today because most of our theology says that we can come before the Lord and do whatever we want, whenever we want. We can bring Him whatever we want, however we want, as long as our heart is pure. I have literally had Christians tell me that as long as my heart is pure, the Lord knows my heart. How many have heard that? The Lord knows my heart. All of you with the hands raised are probably one that said that at one time, a point in your life. The Lord knows my heart. He does. Bible says it's wicked. That's what He says about our heart, Okay. If we take the theology that whatever, the father, whatever our heart says is, is okay, as long as we're sincere, name one religion that doesn't believe that. Name one single religion that does not believe, that, that believes anything different. They, everyone believes that uh, you have to be sincere and your heart has to be pure before your God. What makes us any different? 
What makes us different is that we have a protocol in our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, has set forth in an instruction manual a way to approach him. That's what makes our God different, is that there is a way. This is why universalism and humanism doesn't work. This is why those that say, well, you know, all roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. All roads do lead to heaven, and then they funnel down into one. And it's your choice whether or not you're going to take that single route. So everything that the Bible teaches is predicated on what I'm saying right now, that there is only one way. It's the protocol that Yahweh says for eternal life and for joy. Now, how many believe that God said in his, in his word that there is only one way to get into the kingdom of heaven? That's the Yeshua, the Messiah. You believe that, right? Okay, we all believe that. Now, that is a simple formula. There's only one way into the kingdom, and that is through the blood of the Messiah. Why? Because we broke the Torah, and when you break the Torah, there's a curse that's placed on your life, and you need the curse to be taken away. And the only one that took away that curse is Yeshua. Mohammed didn't do that. He took off, never came back. So if that formula is, is, is right, and I'm a man of formula, I love formulas, I was a math guy, a former fi- financial consultant, and so math is easy for me, and I enjoy it. I love formulas, because formulas, you can, you, can, you can use the scientific method. You can repeat it. You can look at it. It's the same every time. So if the formula at the very top is you, there's only one way in, then the formula for everything else in life is the same, meaning that if you want happiness, if you want joy, if you want peace, if you want all the fruits of the Spirit, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, there's only one way. There's not all these different ways. And so when people sit down with me or one of the elders and they go through counseling and, uh, and, and work through this, it's amazing that we can try. It's so easy to find out what someone's problem is because you can trace it back to them breaking the one way. They chose to do another way. And so if you can go back and discover where you made your mistake and reverse it by, I don't care if it's 20 years ago, you sinned, or you held bitterness against someone, you must make it right because you can't go forward in the Lord and have the fruits of the Spirit because there's only one way. You can't just put things underneath the carpet. Amen? All right, let's keep going because we only got through, I think, one verse. And we've got a lot to go through. Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come visit just any time. Do it according to my way. Then Aaron shall come to the holy place, verse 3, with the blood of young bull, a sin offering, a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic, the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with linen sash. And with the linen turban, he shall be attired. These are kadosh garments. They're set apart. They're holy. They're only for the high priest and only for this moment. What moment is this? We're talking about the Day of Atonement. What day is that? Yom Kippur. When is that? Tishrei 10. Okay, the seventh month, 10th day of the month. This is the highest holy day of the year, bar none. Where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year. This is it. So he should take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots. Okay, so they cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for will be for what's in Hebrew, Azazel. How many ever heard of Azazel goat? How many know in Greek mythology, there's a God called Azazel? Guess what he is? It's a man goat God that was said to be put out in the wilderness and was cursed because he led men astray. You think that's coincidence? The English writers changed this to scapegoat, and in a way, it's an accurate translation, but the reality is, is that the high priest would sacrifice the one goat for, for, it's called the La Adonai goat, the one goat for Adonai, for the Lord, for the sins of Israel. At the same time, he would take his hands, place it over the head of the Azazel goat, confess all the sins on the goat. And then they would lead it out into the wilderness and let it go. It would banish it into the, into the dry places. My question is this. Why on earth would the Lord have a, 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 a goat that is for the Lord, for the sins of Israel, so that the sins of Israel are forgiven, but then reconfess all of the sins onto the 
Azazel goat and take it out into the wilderness. It seems kind of like double jeopardy, if you will. It just seems like uh, doing the same thing twice. What if Azazel really is a fallen angel? And what if Azazel really is the one who led the children of Israel, uh, uh, the children of man, the daughters of men astray? What if Azazel wasn't just Greek mythology? What if it really was the enemy? And so one goat is for the children of Israel, and one goat every single year has the sin of of Israel cast upon it and is sent out to Azazel to remind him that he is cast away into the dark and dry places, and all the sins of Israel are actually accursed and accredited to him. Now, see, what's really interesting in history is they would take the Azazel goat, the scapegoat, and they would lead it out, all the way out to the desert, the middle of the desert, and they would let it go. And then when the priest got back, about 10 minutes later, the goat was back at the front door, because goats aren't dumb. They simply followed the path from which they were laid, and they came, it would come all the way back to Israel. And Knock on the door, if you will, let me in. Sounds like the, you know, the three little pigs, if you, you know, if you think about that story. So they had a big problem on their hands because the sin of Israel was cast out in the desert, but it kept coming back. And it was prophetic because Israel would, would take its, its righteousness and eventually they would take off the robe of righteousness, they would put on a robe of filth, they would sin before their God, and they would return to their vomit. First, they would take their sin, and they would, they, would, they would go out into the desert, get rid of it, and they would be pure, and then the sin would find them back. How many feel that way sometimes? Your sin is always at your door. It seems that every time you get rid of it, it comes back. You just can't get rid of the goat, because the enemy is the same way. He knows where you live. You can't get rid of him, or can you? Because they did something to take care of this problem. They decided to take the goat out to the desert, find a cliff, and push it off the cliff. If it came back then, it was meant to be. But it never came back each and every year. And if the Lord was, was pleased with the sacrifice, they would tie a crimson cloth onto the handle of the outer uh, door of the temple. And the next morning, if the Lord approved of their sacrifice, the this, this scarlet thread would turn white. How many know that for the four, according to the Mishnah, According to the writings of the rabbis of the first century, for the 40 years preceding the destruction of the temple in 68, 70 AD, the crimson cord never turned white. What happened 40 years earlier? The Messiah died, proving that the La'adonai Yom Kippur sacrifice had been done once and for all. Never again did they need to do one sacrifice for all of Israel because he was the sacrifice for all of Israel. Amen? Amen. All right, let's continue. So it goes through and gives all the instructions for the tabernacle, or excuse me, for Yom Kippur. Let's see, where do we want to pick up here? Um, verse 20, and when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess it over the, all the uh, sins of Israel and their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of the suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all of their sin to the uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness." And then Aaron shall come back, take off the linen garments which he put on into the holy place, and shall leave them there, and shall wash his body with water in the holy place, put on his garments, come out, and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. And then it goes on, so on, so on and so forth. I want to start over and talk about Aaron's sons for just a minute, because their desire was to come before the Lord. Now, in in scriptural language, when you say come before the Lord, that means before the Lord, okay? If you're called before the principal or before your boss, you're before them. You're face to face, 
Okay, that's what it means to be before the Lord. It's to be face to face. So the mistake that Aaron's son made is that they went face to face. Now, if you look at the Hebrew word here for face, it's panim, or pana, really. But in the, he- in the Hebrew, uh, face many times, most of the time, is in the plural when it's talking about God's face. It's plural. Why? It, because it's like royalty when it says your honors. Okay? It's pe, noon, yod, and a final mem. Now, underneath it, I put the Paleo Hebrew because I love the Paleo Hebrew. It's the pictograph form of original Hebrew. And on the right, it's actually a mouth. The pe is a form of a mouth. The noon is actually like an agricultural, uh, like, a, like a seed that's bursting forth. And it also is a sperm in life, progenating life. The yod is the first letter in God's name, yod, he, vav, he. And it is a right hand of fellowship or the strength of the right hand. It's the right hand of God. Interesting. What's it say about Yeshua, Jesus the Christ? He sits at the yod. He sits at the first letter of God. He sits at the power. yod heh vav It's the only letter that floats, has no connection. It floats independently of all other letters. And all letters are formed with a yod. Meaning that when you take a pen, every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet, you will have to make a yod first as you're drawing the letter. Which means before all letters there, there is, yod is in every single letter. Yeshua is in every single letter. Every single jot and tittle, if you will. And the final mem, mem is like water. Uh, water can be in the form of a womb, bringing forth and bursting forth new life. Or water can be the water of chaos, like, uh, like Noah's flood, that destroys all uh, vegetation, all life to bring forth new life, all evil. Water both brings forth life, and it destroys evil. And so the word panim in the original Paleo-Hebrew means the mouth of life is the right hand of strength that brings water. Water comes from where? The Shemaim. In Hebrew, water is Maim, and it comes from the Shemaim, the heavens, the heavens. And if you haven't heard this before, it's pretty amazing. The heaven is Shemaim, which is made up of two words, Shem and Maim. Shem is name, Maim is water. The name of water, or the name that brings forth water. So, what does this have to do with anything? This has to do with everything. Because when you want to be in the, how many want to be in the presence of God? You want to be in his presence. I was meditating on this deeply this week. Father, I want to be in your presence. What does it mean to be in your presence? We say, I want to be in your presence. I want to be in your, I want to experience your glory. Everyone wants to be in the presence of the Lord. But yet very few of us want to actually do what it takes to be in the presence of the Lord. Because remember what we established in the very beginning, there's rules, there's protocols. So approaching your king there's rules to approaching your wife. There's rule, rules to approaching your husband. A wife that wants uh, you know, to go out with her girlfriends for a weekend or something, uh, there, she knows how to get to her husband's heart. There are certain rules to our heart, and it starts with a fork. For some of us, it's our stomach. Just a kidding. Bad joke. Edit that one out. But no, seriously, there are rules of engagement when it comes to our king, Yahweh himself. And we want to experience the presence of God. We have to know how to do that. So I've been meditating all week, Father, what does it mean to be holy? Because there's no one holy but you. You say that in your word. You looked and you couldn't find anybody that's holy. Not one person you could find that's holy. Not one, you say. And you even repeat it in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, because you can't find anybody that's holy. Everyone has an agenda. So, Father, what does it mean to be holy? How can I be holy? I want to be in your presence. Is it as easy as what I've always been taught, that if I just believe that Jesus died for me, I'll always be in your presence? I'm in your presence because I don't really feel like I'm in your presence. And, and, and the struggles that I have and the, and the addictions that I had growing up, I, I, I couldn't have been always in the presence of God because... I didn't feel like I was in the presence of God. And according to my Bible, when you're in the presence of Yahweh, you know it. 
because you feel it. It impacts you. It overwhelms you. It changes you. You're never the same. When you're in the presence of God, you can't be depressed. When you're in the presence of God, you can't have envy. Okay, we're going off script for a second. We got, I'm going to ship. We got to do this. You going to bear with me for a second? Because we want to learn. I want to know what it means to be in the presence of the Lord. Hopefully we can get into his presence before the end of the night. There we go. All right, my computer locked up on me. Okay. So let's go to Ephesians. I knew it was there. I don't know why I just didn't go there. Ephesians chapter 5 says this. Do not grieve the, the Ruach, is what, what it's titled, from verse 20, what is that, verse 25. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, you are removing yourself from the presence of God. When you, husbands, when you grieve your wife, you are removing yourselves, yourself from her presence. What is, what is the presence of God anyway? What is anybody's presence? You know, the Holy Spirit is so... Amazing, I think. Even in the langu- English language, he tries to give a hint. Listen to the play on words. I want to be around the presence of God. P R E S E N T S. I want to be around the presence of God. How many love it when it's your birthday and someone remembers and they bring you presents? Don't you want to be around the presents? My children, when we have birthdays, they, they, you know, uh, let's do the games. They only do the games to get to the presents. They want to be, that's their only time of the year, you know. I want to be around the presence of God. What are the presence of God called? The gifts of God. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you want to be in the presence of God, you have to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but you can't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit if, you don't, if you're not in the presence of God. I want you to bear with me for a minute. For those of you that are crossing your heads and not sure where I'm going with this and you think that maybe I just didn't eat lunch today, because the Holy Spirit's building something right now. He wants you to understand that every one of you, He is called into His presence, but unless you do it His way, He will destroy you. Nadab and Abihu, that was a physical manifestation of destruction. It was easy. I love the Old Testament. You know why? Because the principles of God's word are easy to see. Do this, be blessed. Don't do it, off with your head. And we think, we think it's a joke, but it's just so, he's trying to teach us that he means business. When he says do this, he means it. Today, the only reason why you are standing in this room today and it's not off with your head, is because he offed with his son's head on your behalf. You are living in an age of grace. You bear with me for 30 minutes. Just give me 30 minutes. We're going to learn how to get in the presence of God because there is a formula that the enemy has taken away from us and God's people who proclaim to know him, how is it possible to be in the presence of God and say, I know the living God, but walk in envy, jealousness. We walk in, in bitterness and wrath and anger and claim or evil speaking, malice. We don't have forgiveness. We're miserable people. Some of the meanest people I ever met in my life are Christians or in this movement? How is it that religious people can be the most mean people ever? Here's why. Here's why. Because the Bible says that when you call upon the name of the Lord, you are held accountable. They are held accountable on judgment day. You're held accountable now. This is why you have no excuse when you have ought against your brother 
to wait four and a half years. As the, whole, as, as, the, as the unholy spirits of anger and bitterness, clamor and deceit, selfish gain, and grow inside of you, infecting everyone around you. Did you know that the average person, according to science, radically impacts? I'm not talking about lightly impacting. Some of you think that you don't even have any friends. The average person will infect, massively infect and change 200 people's lives during their life. 200. Hundred people. Maybe it's a word of encouragement that caused someone to not commit suicide. You will never know that until judgment day. You radically impacted that person and every person in their lineage. Or the person that you, that you cut off on the side of the highway, that that was the last straw because you were in a hurry and they went and committed suicide because they, they couldn't take the, the constant rejection. You'll never know that. You impacted that person and all their lineage. Everything that we do, say, and think impacts more than just you. You have the opportunity to change people's lives. And somehow we've gotten the idea that just because, uh, you know, we've heard in Christian radio and Christian television our whole life that if you give, you've heard it from me, if you give towards the projects that Yahweh is doing in our life right now with the broadcast project, you will change someone's life. It's absolutely true. You will change someone's life. But the fastest way to change someone's life is to speak life into someone's life. Giving is the cheapest way to serve God. It's so easy. Millionaires can write checks for millions of dollars and give it to their local church. And they call that serving God. Yahweh says, it is definitely one of the ways that I've asked you to serve me, is with the first fruits of your produce. But it is the easiest thing. Why? Because it's just math. Are you kidding me? I got 100 cattle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Take that one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How difficult is it to serve God with your first fruits? You just bank on it. It's His. It's much harder to serve the living God with your heart with your mind, with your soul, and with your strength, and to do Bible things in Bible ways. It's really hard to do that. So here's where most of us live. Most of us live in a place where we're quasi-serving the Lord and quasi-serving ourselves because we like the way it feels. We don't want to move. We don't want to do the right thing because of a five-letter word, P-R-I-D-E, pride. We don't want anybody to think that we've been looking at pornography this week. We don't want anybody to know that we're a mean person at home. We don't want anybody to know that we struggle with this or struggle with that. We don't want anybody to know nothing about us because the enemy has got us by the back of the neck and says, come follow me. You belong to me. You are my Azazel goat. I'm going to take you out to the wilderness, separate you from the children of Israel, and make you mine. And some of you have, been, you have been led out to the wilderness and you've been okay with it. How can you say that you're in the presence of God or you're right with God when you're bitter, when you're angry, when you're, when you're hurting deeply inside? Did you know that you can hurt deeply inside but only for a moment? Moment, Because my Bible says that joy comes in the morning. The Bible, the, the Bible says that God has created a protocol for us to come to him. Yahweh wants us to walk in his presence, and he's given us the opportunity to do that. So how do we do that? Here's what we normally do. Well, let me just give you some ideas of how we don't come into the presence of God. As I begin to meditate on this whole concept of, Father, what does it mean to be in your presence? And I was embarrassed that I can't even believe I'm asking this. But I want so bad to be in his presence I'm assuming I've never been to his presence because I want to be in a deeper presence. I want to be holy as he is holy. When someone says, oh, you're just holier than thou. I want to be holier than thou. I want to be holy, don't you? We're commanded to be holy. So there's two big commandments that Yahweh gave us. It starts at the very top. He says, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to suggest to you, as much as I have started out learning those commandments when I was a child, 
And then I moved into the, the Hebrew Roots movement and the, the, the Hebrew Roots of my faith and learning the front of the book and the Torah and all the, the commandments that hang off of those. I discovered something this week. The only way to sit in the presence of God, truly to go deeper into his presence, is to do those first two perfectly. What do I mean by that? The Father says to love him with all of our heart, with all of our nefesh, our soul, our mind, and our strength. That encompasses all of the commandments underneath it. But the other one, Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what prevents us. This is 50% of the time. Actually, I would say 90% of the time. This is what prevents us from experiencing the power of God in our life. Did you know the most powerful part of God is shalom? Where your soul is at rest. Where you can have the greatest storm around you. People can offend you, call you names. They can throw you up against the wall, crack your head open, and then throw your brain up against the wall. How's that for graphicness? Some of you have experienced that in your life with people are mean. And you'll smile. Because the power of the living God, you are in his presence. How do you think some of the martyrs allow themselves to be tarred, feathered, and burned? at the stake with a smile on their faith on their face because they lived in the presence of God so let's get down to reality so someone offends you or something happens in your life how you handle that situation is 100% determined on whether or not you end up being burned like Nadab and Abihu or you get invited into the holy place like Aaron Here's the, here's the deal. There are two ways that you can be an outcast of Israel. I was going to go through all of this. There's so much to go through, and I'm upset with myself that I'm even doing this in a way, but the Holy Spirit is, is having me do this a little bit different. How many know that all throughout the Torah it talks about that being cut off from the people? Over and over and over again, it says if you do this, if you commit adultery, If a man lies with a man, let me just say it from the pulpit, it says that homosexuality is a sin. And it says that it is is condemnable by death. But did you know adultery is the same? It doesn't separate them and say, oh, homosexuality is worse. It says that all sexual sin is death. So that's one way to be cut off from your people is in the Hebrew word it it can be both ways it can be physically to cut off a limb off of a tree gone dead burned there's another way to be cut off it's the most terrible way to be cut off in Hebrew the concept is, is to is to remove but the other person doesn't know that they're removed It's being cut off from the presence, but not knowing you've been cut off from the presence. It's like I'm the grandfather, and I've got $10 million, and I'm on my deathbed. I want to leave it to my grandson. My grandson does not know that I have $10 million. All I am requiring is that my grandson show up at the hospital to wish me goodbye. And I will give him his inheritance. The grandson doesn't show up at the hospital. I die and the will says he does not get the $10 million. But the thing is, he never even knew it. And he goes his entire life and never knows what he missed. He was removed from his inheritance, from his destiny. Do you think $10 million would change his life? Absolutely, it would change his address. Ladies and gentlemen, the destiny that God has called for you is to be in his presence. It's the only way to reach every, everything that he's called you from your mother's womb. But the only way to get there is to do everything he said all the time. So when you get angry, you deal with it right then. Because being angry will cut you off from the children of Israel. 
You cannot come before the Lord with anger. You cannot come before the Lord with unforgiveness. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you know how many believers in the Messiah go years with unforgiveness in their heart? Do you know what the Bible says? It says in Psalms that those who have not forgiven their brethren, their prayers are an abomination to the Lord. Yet week after week, they'll come before the Lord and they'll raise their hand, they'll pray, they'll go to Bible studies, they'll play their guitars, they'll read the word, they'll do their prayers. And the Lord says, it is as if you are taking your children and moving them through the fires of Molech. That's what your prayers are to me. I'm going to reject all of them. But here's the thing I also learned this week about the Lord. When you're cut off from, from, from Yahweh, from the children of Israel, and the blessings that comes from being around the presence of God, I learned something. A Greco-Roman mindset says, cut off over here, done away with. In Hebrew, Yahweh is a loving, graceful, a merciful God. So he cuts someone off. It's kind of like living your life anywhere you want to go in the world. But to be cut off is to put you in a 10 by 10 room. You're not dead. You're still this child. But what you don't know is all you're getting is the rations under the door. He's feeding you. He loves you. He still guarantees to take care of you because it's his word. Poor God has to keep his word. Because how many of us seriously deserve death? And sometimes I wonder if, if Yahweh says, man, I just, sometimes I wish I would have never sent my son because I'd really like to clobber that person right now. But I can't. So we're living with, we're living cut off from God. So what does it mean to not be cut off God? It means to be inside the palace where the presence of God are. What are the presence? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Where there's pastors, teachers, apostles, evangelists, those that exhort, those that have the ministry of hospitality, of faith, love, joy, all of the things that he's given us, all of the gifts, and all of the presence. That's where we're supposed to live. But the moment that we transgress the Most High God's law, we are removed from His presence. Now, Christianity says the law of God is done away with. If you do away with the law of God, no one can ever be cast into outer darkness into the lake of fire. Because the only way someone gets to the lake of fire is by being under a curse, which happens when you break the law. So if you get rid of the law, there's no curse, which means there's no definition of sin because sin is transgression of the law, which means I can do whatever I want. Stop sending people to tell me about Jesus. Save your money. Go on vacation. Let me live in Africa by myself. It's the same way in our lives, my friends. We still believe that the law of God is done away with. I've been in the Hebrews movement now for 10 years, studying deeply for seven And I have to say that I truly believe that most of the people in this movement are living their lives as if the law of God is done away with. Now, we say it's not done away with. We'll post nice little graphics on our Facebook page saying that it's not done away with. We'll like someone who says the law of God brings life. While we break the law of God every single day of our life. Why we, why we disdain one another, why we say mean things to one another, why we in private slander one another, which the Bible says he destroys those people. We're okay with doing these things and saying these things. We're okay with looking at pornography or thinking about other people or this or that and the other. We live our lives as if the law of God has done away with like There is no consequence to our sin. And we wonder why we don't have joy, why we don't have shalom. Let me just put a a, a formula out here right now. I love formulas, and I started with that. If you do not have perfect shalom in your life and joy and peace, I'll stop there because I could go further. Let's just make it easy. 
Listen to what I'm saying, every one of you, all of you out around the world, there's thousands of you listening. Listen to what I'm getting ready to say because here's the litmus test of your life. If you do not have shalom, you're not living in the presence of God, period. You're not following him, you're not obeying him, you are not in his will if you do not have shalom. Because it's like saying that I live in the king's castle, but I don't get to eat his food. It's not possible. If you are living in the king's castle, you get his food. If you are living outside, you breathe the air. If you're not breathing air, you might be underwater. This is simple. We've made this so complex. I was going to teach the Torah portion today. The Lord wants me to preach it. I hope you're okay with this. We've made it so complex. We banner, here's what I believe. You're always throwing, showing me this in the spirit realm this week. You cannot imagine the, the intense prayer even coming up to, I was in my, this is why I was late to, tonight, in my office. Father, show me what it means to be in your presence. What am I missing? I don't understand it. Why did you kill them? What is, all, what is this all about? How do we get in your presence? He said, Jim, it's really simple. Do what I say every single time with the right motive and you'll be in my presence. Don't make it complicated. Somehow, some way, I believe this, the Lord showed me this, at the end of time, there are people in this movement that believe in the front of the book and the back of the book that will stand before God and he will say, depart from me, I don't know you. Even though you preached the Torah, you taught the Torah, but you've never been in my presence. Because remember that one year back, so on and so forth, when you broke the scriptures and you chose to live in anger and bitterness and resentment because someone offended you and you couldn't forgive them? I don't know what it means to be in his presence when he comes back, but I can tell you right now, he's telling us how to get into his presence now. I know life is complicated. My life is, I will challenge you for complicated lives. But I will tell you, the simplicity of living in his presence is to have that constant shalom. If you have shalom, ladies and gentlemen, you have everything. Because shalom does not mean peace. It means all the prosperity, all the love, all the joy, all the peace, the kindness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control, everything that God ever desired for you from the moment that you hit your mother's womb, that is what he gives you when you have shalom, you have it all. You have the full power of God. You have the white light, every color of the rainbow. Because within shalom is everything else you're looking for. You seek prosperity, you'll not have shalom. I've been there. You don't want to be prosperous and not have shalom because to be prosperous without shalom is to be rich without God. You are poor. Yahweh is desiring his people to get out of themselves and get over themselves and start doing, we say start doing Bible things in Bible ways. You know what the Father showed me this week? Get out of my commandments and start doing the first one first and maybe then I'll show you how to do the rest. Quit bannering to everybody else that they need to keep the Torah. And why don't you start keeping the Torah and go ask forgiveness for the person that you hurt their feelings or you gossiped or you slandered or you hurt them years ago. How do you know if you're out of his will? You won't have shalom. Do you see how simple this is? How do you know when to start a sporting event? When the referee shows up? You can't start a sporting event without a referee. It's amazing. You get professional Major League Baseball uh, baseball players, basketball players, whatever. Take the referee out and watch them. They'll look like children walking around. What do we do now? Like they've never been to their own sporting event before. No one knows what to do. If you're walking around aimlessly and you don't know what to do, and you're feeling all of these things that you shouldn't be feeling. Maybe the referee left your room. Maybe it's time that you ask yourself, 
Maybe it's not the other person that's causing the pain in my life. Because my Bible says people can hurt you, but pain only lasts for a night. And then if you are in the presence of God, joy comes in the morning. We cannot live, my friends, in a place where we forget the simplicity of how to stay in the presence of God. We cannot be envious or jealous or have bitterness or wrath or anger. We cannot speak evil of one another. Let me just throw this out at you. If someone hurt your feelings, which everyone in here, I don't care what age you are, someone has hurt your feelings. If you cannot go and hug that person, you are not living in the full presence of God. Soak that one up. So let me just confess to you, I'm not living in the full presence of God because I'm not that holy yet, but I'm working on it. I want it. The difference between someone who is an outcast of Israel and someone that's living inside is not someone that's perfect and someone that's, that's not perfect. It's someone that's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and refuses to repent and they're missing their presence, their inheritance, and someone who's also a sinner and fallen short of the glory of God, but they know it and they want to get up the next day and they want to make it right with everyone around them, including the Most High. That's the difference. You get the power of God, the presence of God, the shalom of God when you do the things of God. I was talking to a, a, a fellow coworker this week and I said, you know, got this group of people in my life that, that are, they don't play very nice. Anybody have a group of people in your life that don't play nice? And I, you know, I just, I don't know what to do about this group of people that don't play nice. And throughout this conversation, I learned that it doesn't matter about the group of people that don't play nice. Yeah. See, the enemy wants you to focus on the group of people that don't play nice. Because it's so easy. They're wrong, you're right. Who wants to focus on yourself when you know they're wrong? And sometimes maybe they are. Maybe it is. Maybe everyone tells you around you, you're, they're wrong. They sinned against you. They run over your dog. You didn't do anything. You let the dog out, they run over it. But the reality of the, the, the Father's way of His presence is this is how we treat those that hurt us, is by looking at what Moses did. He is my mentor next to Yeshua, because I read a lot about him, and I don't get him sometimes. I do feel like a stuttering fool sometimes. But Moses said this, when the children of Israel rebelled with the rebellion of Korah, 250 of his top leaders died that day. When they made fun of him because of his stuttering, when they said, we want to go back, who the heck are you? When his own sister-in-law and brother said, hey, did you think that God only speaks through you? What about us? Miriam gets leprosy. Through all of that, over and over again, even the Most High said, Moses, you can't hear it, but I can hear their grumbling. Get out of my way. I'm going to destroy them right now. If I'm Moses, I'm like, oh, uh, okay. Go for it. I don't like him anyway. Me and you will go to the promised land. I'll get it all. No, Moses begged the father, stuck out, its, stuck out his arms like this, said, Father, don't do it. Don't do it. Have mercy on your people. And we wonder how he lived in the presence of God, how he came down and his face was shining. Because nobody loves people like that. There's only one other person on this planet that went like this and said, Father, don't do it. Don't do it. As his enemies bore holes in his wrists. We all have holes in our wrists from our enemies. Let's just be honest. Most of us have holes in our wrists from our friends and our family. We're a hurting bunch of people. But the Father says that there's a secret 
in the midst of hurt, in the midst of trouble. And if you're not in trouble, you'll be in trouble because it's life. If it was called, if it was fun, they would have called it fun, but they call it life. It has its valleys, it has its peaks. So the next time you go through your, your peak, for those of you, your valley, for those of you in the peak, remember this. There is a secret passageway. There is a, there is a, there is a T in the road, and you have a choice to go left or a choice to go right. Either you do what the Bible says. When you make an oath before man, did you know that when you sign your name to a contract in legal lease, you better hold to it or they'll sue you? How many know that? You should all know that. If you own a house, an apartment, or anything, you legally bound your name, the sign of your nature, which is what signature means. How many know that in the spiritual realm, the second that you bowed the knee to Yeshua, the Messiah, you gave your signature, the sign of your nature, to the Most High God, saying that I will follow your word. I will do what you say. I will love my neighbor. When I'm hurt, I will go to them, and I will forgive them. Even if they're a jerk to me when I go to them, I will forgive them, and I will let it go as east is from the west. I will say, Father, have mercy on my friends. When you do that, it is the secret passageway into the mountain. Someone had a dream in the last couple of weeks, amazing dream. People send me these dreams. Some of them are so from Yahweh, that it's unbelievable. I could spend an hour just reading dreams. One of them, this lady had a dream and she dreamt that there were angels that were dispatched. I can't tell the whole dream but there were, uh, of how they came about, but the, the angels got, were dispatched and they went to and fro from the earth and their job was to release the people of God. So they went, into, they were, went to the mountains and they were pouring out chunks of mountains looking for the people of God in, in the mountain to bring them out into their inheritance. You see, there's, there's, two, there's really three types of people. There's the person that's wandering out in the desert and they have no idea where they're at or what they're doing. They have no purpose in life. So they go buy the book and it still doesn't help them. The second person is the person that is in the mountains, safe with the Most High God. But they're not living their destiny. They're not living their purpose. The third person is the person who lived in the mountain, but recognizes that's not where their home is. That's not where their mission is. Excuse me, that's where their home is, but that's not where their mission is. They're to go out into the highways and the byways. And so these angels were ripping off tops of mountain and chunks of mountain because it it was finally time for the people of God to come out of the mountain and move into their mission. And it took this angel forever to find two here, three there, a group here, a group there. I want to submit to you that that you are one of those three people. The third group, the people that are walking in their destiny, are walking in the power of God. Do you know another way that you can tell if, if someone is walking in the power of God? You will see miracles. You will see supernatural signs and wonders. You will see people healed. You will see marriages healed. You will see people that their marriages aren't healed because you have one spouse that is a bozo, but the other spouse goes from being completely hurt to emotionally healed. And they can smile in the presence of their jerk husband because the power and the presence of God is around them all the time. Who wouldn't smile in the presence of the Most High? Now, I'm not saying we don't have bad days. We do have bad days. But I'm telling you right now, in your worst day, you should have peace in your life. You should be like my daughter when we found out. She, she found out that we're, we're losing our house when we had to move. And I, and I told her, I said, Sierra, you know, we, we, we have to move. She said, awesome. I said, no, you, you must have not heard me. We have to move. She goes, I know. That means God's going to do a miracle. Yeah. My 11-year-old lives more in the presence of God than I have most of my 38 years. Don't you want to live like that? Don't you want to have an attitude like that? 
Don't you want to live in such an unbelievable, on the tips of your toes, you can't put your heels down because you're so excited about every part of your life. Where's the passion in your life? I don't care what your personality is, if you're melancholy. I don't care if you're a laid back person and people say, he's so even keeled that concrete is jealous. I don't care how straight-lined you are, nothing makes you laugh, nothing makes you cry. No one's ever seen your lips move in either direction. My God says that if you know Him, you will laugh in the face of your enemies. You will grin at trials and tribulations. Are they hard? Yes. My Bible says do not pray that God will take away the trial or the tribulation. It says to pray for the endurance to endure, the courage to endure. I praise the Father for all the tribulations of my life. I go through more tribulations than most anybody I know over and over and over again. And I say, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because every time that I do, I get to hear my, my, my daughter's voice in the background, awesome. That means God's getting ready to do another miracle. We started off this entire message with those crazy warning labels. I want to ask you, those seem so crazy. It seems so obvious. Don't take a curling iron and try to curl your eyelashes. It seems so obvious that when you go to the bathroom, not to take the gum out of the toilet. It seems so obvious that if you're going to check the oil or the gas level in your car, don't do it with a match to see the level of the fuel. But why do they put those warning labels on there? Because someone did. Someone, I don't know how they sit in front of a judge with a straight face and say, this giant curling iron burned my eye. But they do. They didn't read the warning label. The fourth commandment seems awfully obvious when it says, thou shalt remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Seems pretty obvious. Why do we break it? For any good reason. Yesterday, as silly as it sounds, I... I get to play my first round of golf tomorrow. I'm so excited. My wife's going to a baby shower or a wedding shower. Not that I'm excited my wife's going to a wedding shower, but I'm excited that I get a a, a few hours to go play golf with a a good friend and get out in the the sunshine. But I I knew I needed to make a a tea time, but it was last minute and it's Shabbat. So I was online and I was was gonna call and I'm just opening my chest. I'm real like you. And my wife says, what are you doing over there? And I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm studying the Bible. What are you doing? And she said, Jim, you don't need to do that. Why? Trust the Lord. Nailed. Helped, kept accountable by my wife. And I realized, you know what? So what if they don't have a tea time available? So what if I don't get to play golf? Who's more important? The presence of God? Or being in a golf court? How many times have we done the obvious? We do the dumb things when the warning label is so clear. It's so clear it goes beyond the obvious and says, don't feed the bears your fingers. And what do we do? Ah, they're so cute. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to know the book. It frustrates me that I can't go through Leviticus 16, 17, 18, and 19 like I really want. There's so many laws in there, so many amazing things that have been taken out of context that people don't understand, things that we're not doing, things that we need to do. You need to know the book. It's the warning label. It's the instruction manual. It's the guardrails. It is the GPS that tells you, turn around, you're going the wrong way.
You know what man's instruction manual is like? It's like at the Dallas conference in 2010, January, we were in Frisco. We just finished our conference and we were late for our, our plane. We had an hour and 20 minutes before our plane left and it was a 25 minute drive to the airport. Everybody, we're all stoked and excited and exhausted all at the same time. A whole suburban full of people that, and all of our luggage and we're packed in there. And we take off and I plug in the address to the, to the airport and we just, I'm just following the instruction manual, man. I mean, that's what men do. We don't have to think. We don't do that very well anyway. So I'm just listening to the directions of the GPS. And about four miles down, it says, get off on the exit. I get off on the exit. It says, make a left. I make a left. It says, make another left. I make another left. I'm heading down the highway. About four miles down the ride, it says, get off on the right. I get off on the right. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do because that's what it says. It says, make a left. Make a left. I make another left. About three times, I realized we're going in circles. I just got off of this exit 10 minutes ago, but I didn't notice it. The person that noticed it looked over and said, hey, isn't that our hotel? It had been 20 minutes. And I went, oh, we're in big trouble. We pulled off on the side of the road and, and I had typed the address in wrong. So what happened was, is that the traditions and the doctrines of men, the instruction manual that I was using was taking me in circles and I never hit my destination. I never got to get on the plane to take off. It is only when we extract from the word of God exactly what it says and do exactly what it says and when in doubt, do exactly what it says. When you're not sure, do exactly what it says. When man says, I don't know, do exactly what it says. Because on judgment day, this is what I like to tell uh, you know, my, my, some of my religious friends or even atheist friends, here's what I say on judgment day, if there is a judgment day, let's pretend that there is. If I'm wrong and you're right, I miss nothing. I've lived a holy life, a good life. I, I, I've been faithful to my wife. I've loved my wife. My children were in peace and joy and all those things that you, don't, you think I shouldn't have because that's a crutch. I love my crutches. But if I'm right and you're wrong, you lose big time. So which side would you, and I've told my atheist brother-in-law this, I don't understand you. You're the most logical person that I know. Statistics say that if I'm right and you're wrong, you are thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity and destroyed. If I'm wrong and you're right, I lose nothing. Wouldn't you logically do what I'm doing just in case? So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, let's end it. I want the presence of God in my life. I want the power of the living God to come down in this place and in every place that we are broadcasting today. The only way it can happen is if we clean our plates. We are eating on plates and leaving them on the dining room table. That plate gets dirty, it gets hard and very difficult and the longer you keep that food on there, the harder it is to clean. The fastest way to clean your plate is immediately when you're done. When you get, this morning, my children, one of my ch children, wonderful children, I'll tell you how awesome my children are, they brought me breakfast in bed this morning. I was reading the word, they brought me waffles with about three inches of syrup in there, so they were swimming waffles. <laughs> I didn't know waffles could float, but they do. And I got, I'm still eating, I'm so hungry, they're so good, I, I was eating them all the way down to the crumbs. Anybody ever get down to the crumbs and you just like try to scoop up the crumbs? Well, as I'm scooping up the crumbs, I want to get the crumbs away from the soup of syrup. So I tilt the, the, the plate to get the syrup. I'm so concentrated on the waffle, I'm missing the fact that it's water falling into my bed. Yes, that's your syrup that you poured. <laughs> There is nothing frustrating than having sticky, nasty syrup flowing down your chest, down your side, and onto their bed. And you're holding a plate in one hand, and you're holding a glass, a, 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 a fork in the other hand, and there's nothing you can do. So... What did I do? 
Immediately put the, actually I ate the, the rest of the waffle real quick. I figured if it's all running out, what does it matter? It's dry now. Then I put the plate down, I immediately got up, I wiped it with a dry cloth, and then I got a wet rag, soaked the bed, and, and, it, and it came out. Now, what would happen if I'd have left it there? Like most of you men would have done. <laughs> and I went, you know, went to fellowship and came back tonight, slid right into bed. <laughs> Honey, how are you tonight? What is that weird feeling on my leg? It's very difficult to get out, isn't it? It embeds itself in the very fabric. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, when you don't take care of business, that pain will embed itself into the very fabric of your soul. To get rid of the pain is almost to rip your entire being apart. It's so difficult to deal with pain and bitterness and anger and envy and strife and all of the works of the flesh if you don't take care of it immediately. I know many of you are, are not uh, confrontational, when people hurt your feelings, you don't like to say something. I'm telling you, don't convince yourself that it's okay. They didn't mean it. Take care of business. Clean up the syrup while it's still wet. It's still yucky, but you can do it. And when you do so, you reestablish the presence between those two people, and you reestablish the presence of the Most High God. At the end of the day, the Father is going to ask us several questions when we stand before him. Did you love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength? And by keeping my commandments, do you choose, do you show that you love me? And number two, did you love your neighbor truly? And did you have, number three, was your motivation to lift up my name or yours? How many of us passed the first two tests, but then the selfish pride of our own life, we can't lay down our pride? Bottom line, and we'll end with this. I'm going to say the formula again because I believe Holy Spirit wants to make this abundantly clear for everybody that's listening today. If you do not have shalom in your life, if you do not have peace, You're not in the presence of God. You're not in his favor, and you are an outcast of Israel. You are cut off from the Most High God. You're not living your best. You're getting the rations put underneath the door. When you follow him and love him, if you have peace and joy, and kindness and gentleness and you are excited about life no matter what part of life that you're in you're in the presence of God because the presence of the enemy don't feel like that the presence of God darkness flees if you're feeling the negative emotions you're wrong whatever you think about yourself you're wrong because the power, listen, I'm being serious, the power of God transcends your emotions. If you were right, you would be experiencing shalom. And even if you are right, your motivation, your heart might be wrong. Because it's not all about being right. It's all about being in His presence right. Amen? Would you stand with me tonight, please?